On the 15th of May 1948, the British mandate over Palestine ended and the State of Israel was proclaimed by its first Prime Minister, David Ben-Gurion. Forty years on, Israel is still not at peace. Tonight, to discuss the future of Israel and the Palestinians, we have assembled a group of people who meet in unprecedented circumstances. We believe this is the first time an official PLO representative has sat down in a television studio with Israeli citizens of stature. On my left, Moshe Amirav, who came to Israel from Europe in 1949. He fought as a paratrooper in three Arab-Israeli wars. He was a key figure in the development of the expansionist policies that brought the right-winger Menachem Begin to power in 1977. But three years ago, Moshe Amirav underwent a political conversion. Later, he'll tell us what that conversion was. The Right Honourable Gerald Kaufman, MP, the seventh child of a Polish Jewish immigrant tailor. After studying at Oxford, he became a journalist and then worked in Harold Wilson's private office before becoming a Labour MP. When last year he was named Shadow Foreign Secretary, the Daily Mirror asked in an editorial whether he could do the job given his pro-Israeli leanings. Yohanan Lahav fled from the Nazis in 1943 to Palestine, where he joined the Jewish guerrillas who were fighting the British. After independence, he became an officer in the Israeli army and, in 1967, a war correspondent on the Golan Heights. He is now the European correspondent of Israel's biggest-selling daily paper. Mr. Faisal Aweda was born in East Jerusalem. He was expelled from Israel in the late 60s and joined the PLO in the early 70s. He rose to become the PLO ambassador to India. Following the killing of Al Satori, the PLO's, ma PLO's man in London, Faisal Aweda moved to Britain, where he is now the PLO representative in the United Kingdom. Marie Colvin this week won a British Press Award for international reporting. She has increasingly been specialising in the Middle East and for the past five months has been covering the Palestinian uprising in Gaza and the West Bank, from whence she has just returned. Anton Shamas is the celebrated Israeli novelist. Born in Galilee in a Christian Palestinian village, he's an Israeli Palestinian who writes in Hebrew to reach a Jewish audience. Later, he may tell us what being an Israeli Palestinian means to him. Nadia Hijab is a Palestinian who has always lived in exile. She was formerly the editor of the highly respected Middle East magazine. She's recently written a feminist interpretation of the Old Testament. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to you all. Marie Colvin, let's uh, perhaps begin, if we may, with you. Um, you went to Israel as a journalist, presumably with relatively few preconceived notions. What were your first impressions of Israel as a state? Um, well, when you first go there, I think you, you do have in mind Israel as a state, everything you've read about it. Also, you, you expect, uh, and I suppose we'll, we'll get into that on this program, some kind of conflict with the Palestinians to be immediately something that you, you notice immediately. What you realize when you get there is, first of all, you have to say there's a lot of similarities. I mean, both Israelis and Palestinians will say to you, you know, at, at, uh, we're cousins, and um, there is this kind of part of the problem and part of whatever solution there may be, I think, is that there's a familiarity, uh, there's a similarity. Um, you see it in little things. The food is the same among everybody. There's a reverence for history. Um, anyone you meet on either side, Israeli or a Palestinian, wants to make sure that you understand the basic historical uh, progression of the, you know, of, of course, uh, there on their terms. Um, there's reverence for education on both sides. I think what you're seeing now is that uh, you have generations who almost know each other too well, so well that uh, the, the barriers are gone. And I suppose one could say that's good and that's bad. I mean, that's, uh, but that is the situation now. I think that's very different than 40 years ago. When you say know, know each other too well, what exactly do you mean by that? Um, I think 40 years ago you had uh, you had Jews and you had Palestinians, you had uh, a conflict, people who uh, 
the Jews that came to Israel were mostly European Jews, um, didn't know Palestinians, Palestinians didn't know them. You now have generations that have grown up next to each other, side by side. Uh, Palestinians work in Israel, an extraordinary number of West Bank and Gaza. Palestinians work, go back and forth. They live in the West Bank, they work in Israel, they know the Israelis very well. Uh, Israelis have, perhaps don't have to go to the West Bank, but they do have uh, a sense of Israeli Arabs, uh, Palestinians among them. So you no longer have two strange peoples. And I think that, as I said, that makes it more difficult and perhaps uh, down the line uh, and the possibility <coughs> of a solution, one could, one could see that given the familiarity now. It's very interesting. You, you talk there about the, the similarities and, and, and one, might, uh, one might imagine that there, there would be less conflict if those similarities were, were sort of played up a little more. Uh, well, you mm. have, I mean, there, you know, that said, there's a very basic conflict. There are two peoples. There uh, is one land. I mean, Palestinians are not Jews. Jews are not Palestinians. They both uh, care very, I mean, you have a very deep sense of caring for the land that you don't feel in most other places. I mean, that is, it, it is a, both sides are some of the more intense feelings for the territory. It's not just nationalism. It's not just patriotism. It's an absolute attachment to, to the land. And I think that's something that can't be forgotten either. It's the same land. Uh, I'm interested. I mean, you were mentioning food. I mean, there are other similarities, m music, cultural similarities, and, mm -hmm. and so on. Moshe Amirav, let me, let me ask you do, you, do you perceive those similarities as being in any way significant in, uh, in the search for peace in the Middle East? No, I don't see the way she sees it in terms of bringing the parties closer to each other. Uh, on the contrary, I see a situation in which uh, both sides deny each other, and they still deny each other after, uh, I would say, 100 years. I mean, if you ask my father, and he came from Poland, and he still thinks that he will wake up tomorrow morning and he won't see the Palestinians around. They will just disappear. And I'm sure there are some Palestinians who think the same as my father. And the uh, basic, I would say, conflict is this denial of uh, the two nations. That's not on the personal level, of course. On the personal level, we eat the hummus together. We go to each other. Uh, we walk together. On the surface of it, it's quite nice. When, when you come deeper to what it really means to recognize each other, which means to recognize the very, I would say, uh, aspirations of myself as a nation or of Nadia's as a nation, then we are in a conflict. And I'm sure we will see it very soon here, even in this program. Anton Shamas, you, do you believe that the, the similarities are, are in a sense a veneer and that deep down there is a, a major conflict? Uh, maybe, maybe deep down, but there's another thing deep down which I just noticed that, if, if I may have this observation, that Moshe Amirav is holding his hands the same way that I am holding my hands, and, and maybe this is this oriental flight as it was described today on BBC2 by our uh, President Herzog talking about this, these orientalists, uh, these orientals who have this imagina flight imagination. Anyway, uh, I, 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 I can see that Faisal too is holding his hands the same way. We, we all come from the Middle East, as you can tell. And deep down, there are similarities. Uh, if 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 may, maybe maybe later I'll just tell you about 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 one one of these similarities, which which is that both languages are written from right to left, and uh, so far as the Jews are concerned, and I, maybe maybe just in in, in parentheses I, I will relate to to what Marie was saying. She was saying she was talking about Israelis and Palestinians, and I felt awkward because. She meant when she said, "When you say Israelis, you we mean strictly terms, right? Jews." Jewish and <laughs> when I say Israelis, I mean a totally different term. Anyway, uh, if Hebrew and Arabic are both written from right to left, uh, there is the, this basic Semite similarity. But but unfortunately, 
uh, although Hebrew is written from right to left, it flows from left to right because it is necessarily a Western language. And, and if Israel wants to be a part of the Middle East, it should recognize the fact that everything should flow in the Middle East from the right to the left. This might explain, by the way, why looking at the map, why the Arabs all the time, or most of the Arabs, most of the time, want to throw Israel to the sea because they just look at, look at it and, and their hand goes from, from right to left while Israel comes to the Middle East trying to stretch its borders, you know, this way, going that way. And right. that's right, East left to left, right, and that's, that's the conflict. And, and, and uh, if, you, if you might recall that, uh, Herzl and, and Noda at the turn of the century uh, they define Zionism as stretching eastward the limit of culture. So that, that's where the conflict lies. There are similarities. We must try hard to find them.